The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Last week, tonight's guest delivered his eighth State of the Borough address, including talk about housing and homelessness, development, rezonings, and even a new subway line. We will ask Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. about those issues and much more. He has been our most frequent guest since even before he first served in the State Assembly, which was in 1997. Neither of us want to count how many years that is. Uh, welcome back to Bronx Talk, the first citizen of the Bronx, Ruben Diaz Jr. It's, it's good to be back, Gary. And uh, let me just say this before we start. I want to thank BronxNet and all of the faculty, uh, Max, uh, Nabi, and the entire crew for coming in and, and broadcasting the state of the borough. And special shout out to Helen, too, on the BronxNet uh, team. Uh, and in fact, uh, Monday and Tuesday at 11, Wednesday and Friday at 7, Sunday at 2 o'clock, they can see the entire speech. But we're going to break it down here today and yeah, do get it. into okay. some of the, the, the details. Let's start with housing, um, <clears throat> which we'll approach from a few different perspectives. You said in the speech that the city has not been able to stem the tide of homelessness, uh, which now is at more than 60,000, which is a horrible number to even consider. How did we get to this point? And is somebody at fault? Is there a system at fault? Why did this happen? It's a complicated issue, and, and people need to realize that uh, there are different things that we have to address. Number one, when you look at the street homeless, uh, that's a smaller population, obviously, than the 60,000 that are homeless uh, every night in the shelter system. Those people in the street population need uh, mental health uh, uh, services. Uh, the 60,000 plus every night, what folks don't realize, Gary, is the when you speak of the adults, the overwhelming majority of the adults who are homeless actually have a job. How do we get those people back on their feet, back into uh, some type of housing? We need also to have permanent supportive housing. We also need to understand that the real face to all of this is out of the 60,000 individuals, 24,000 are children. Uh, and then when I say we, I'm also talking about the community because a lot of folks will say, well, yes, I want to be, I want to help out. I have a big heart. I just don't want them to live nowhere near me. And that's the reason why the shelter siting process has been mired in politics. The city needs to do a better job in involving the community. The community needs to be, do a better job in being open-minded as to who it is that we need to help um, in every corner, not just of the Bronx, but throughout the city of New York. In his State of the City, um, it was pointed out that the mayor did not talk about homelessness, despite the fact that he's taken that a lot was a of huge heat mistake on his part. Yes, because uh, look, when you when you speak of a state of whether it's the state of the borough, state of the city, state of the state, state of the na uh, of the nation, of of the union, what you're basically saying is last year we said we would do A, B, C, and this is what we were able to accomplish. What we want to do moving forward is X, Y, Z. Uh, when you look at the city of New York, obviously with all of the issues that a mayor has to confront, today the one of the top three, I would say, that are on everyone's lips is homelessness. For a mayor, any mayor to say, well, it's the state of the city, uh, and I know that homelessness is a big issue, but I don't want to talk about it, I'll stay tuned a couple of weeks, um, I, I don't think served him well. Should he take some heat for the, the state of homelessness right now? Is, is that part of that on, on his responsibility? Are you, uh, are you frustrated by it? Uh, yes, if you're, if you're the mayor, I think we all, again, we all have to do our share. But if you're the mayor, you have to make sure that your agencies are uh, cutting the red tape when it comes to providing adequate homes. When, uh, when you do uh, situate someone, make sure that the housing is adequate, that you don't do it with slumlords so that you don't have a catastrophe like what we saw in last December in Hunts Point where the radiator exploded and killed two children. You have to make sure that we have more permanent support of housing, and we have to streamline that in a way where, it, you know, folks can get into those homes expeditiously. You can do, for instance, the Link, uh, Link NYC program 
so that when you do affordable housing, there should be a carve out of percentages of units so that landlords or the people, the developers that you're helping out with this program, they know that they have to take those working adults in the shelter system uh, so they only have to pay 30% of their uh, salaries for uh, their rent. There's so many things that we can do and, and we were hoping to hear from the mayor uh, what are the, some of the steps he's gonna take moving forward. We still await to see his proposals. You talked about uh, 1,600 units, uh, supportive housing units uh, that you got built, mm -hmm. which is nice, of course, when you compare that to the 24,000 children and the 60,000 people. Um, it's nowhere near what is really right. needed. What are the issues in getting that built? And I'll just uh, interject before you answer. We both know that, for instance, the Commons, which is coming uh, you know, to, to the South Bronx, Wetco has done a very good job because they get it. They get the idea. They understand that. <laughs> there needs to be uh, that kind of support system. What are the issues in building more permanent supportive housing? You gotta make sure that developers are open-minded to do it. You have to have it so that they have a strong uh, organization that's gonna provide the supportive services. You gotta get the financing, uh, so the financial institutions. You gotta get the city to also help out with the financing. In some cases, you'll also have the state agency, HCR, but ultimately as well, uh, Gary, you have to see that you have to have community, the community boards, community organizations, local elected officials also uh, being supportive. In some community boards, you see a more open-mindedness. In other community boards, they say, nope, not in my backyard. If it comes across your desk, you, you would be happy to be a mediator amongst all that diverse group, whether it be developers, communities. I'm assuming you would be right there if, if necessary. Uh, we've been doing so over the last eight years. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we, can, we need to continue to have that dialogue. I know that there's a lot of frustration among uh, property owners, homeowners, community leaders, uh, whenever something is proposed, particularly around shelters. And that's because there hasn't been this level of, of dialogue from the city. But when you talk about supportive, permanent supportive housing, uh, they should understand that uh, there are a number of great, credible organizations. The buildings look aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and it's a great way for us to all do our fair share to get people back in homes and more importantly to get children uh, stability in their lives that they so much need. You uh, talked about it in your State of the Borough address and it's no <clears throat> surprise to you, me or anybody watching. Public housing is an absolute mess. Uh, the amount of money that I think uh, Council Member uh, Richie Torres, who's the chair of the uh, Public Housing Committee, has talked about uh, is $15 billion to fix it, uh, especially given what's going on in the federal government right mm -hmm. now, that money is likely not coming. Mm -hmm. um, can something be done to address the plight of the projects, which really affects so many things because it, it's not only the housing, but it affects health care, it affects education, it affects crime and security. Can we do something now while we wait to get more funding to build the housing? Well, certainly we have to have the city and the state at least pick up some more of the slack and we see more and more of an investment uh, from the city. We need to do the same from the state and hopefully we'll get to a situation uh, where the federal government understands how important uh, public housing is. Uh, but we, what, what I tried to convey in my State of the Borough address, Gary, is that at the very least what we need to start doing is making sure that A, we treat the people who live in public housing with respect. The same respect that you and I uh, would want from anyone. That means cleanliness, it means a safe haven. It also means that perhaps we should take advantage of some of the community centers and provide certain services, whether it's uh, computer literacy skills, financial literacy, job placement, uh, workforce development. We could do a lot of that. Uh, and I think that there's that willingness from elected officials to do it. Uh, what we also have to make sure is that public housing is safe. And that's the reason why uh, we're gonna have, the, we have already a, a New York City Housing Authority task force with Richie Torres, with Vanessa Gibson. We're gonna take the show on the road and meet with all of the NYCHA developments and then, uh, in, the, in the Bronx and then put those recommendations forth to NYCHA. At least as it pertains and it relates to safety in public housing. You did talk about that. I hadn't, frankly, heard about that before your State of the Borough. Is that in place? Is it about to be in place? What's the status of that? It's in place. Uh, uh, Richie Torres is the chair of the uh, Public Housing Committee. Mm -hmm. Vanessa Gibson is the chair of the Public Safety Committee. So what we did is that um, we, uh, we thought it made sense. The three of us can get together. We met with um, dozens and dozens of tenant leaders in NYCHA. 
and we've already had our first hearing, and so we're going to continue to move around the Bronx, continue to get more information from them, put out a report, so stay tuned for that. But we want, we want to work with um, Chairwoman Shola from NYCHA and make sure that at the very least, even if we can't get the 15 to $17 billion to do some of the infrastructure stuff, that there are other things that we can do to let the people of NYCHA know that we are representatives for them as well and that we want to do everything that we can uh, uh, for them to, to better their lives. Uh, well, I can tell you if there is a report, I want to see it mm -hmm. and I want to do something to represent the work of that task force here because I, personally I view this as a central issue in uh, improving uh, the borough of the Bronx. I thought it was fascinating you said in the speech uh, that the proposed rezoning of Jerome Avenue must minimize displacement. As you know, many critics have said, oh, you're you know, the king of gentrification and you don't care king, about displacement. The king of gentrification, uh, <laughs> that's pretty harsh. I'm saying critics have said yeah. that. Um, the residents and businesses <clears throat> in that area are not only scared, they're angry. Uh, you talked about certification for auto businesses. Mm -hmm. I was thinking there's a very similar uh, uh, process that uh, we had at the Bronx Terminal Market that many of the uh, people who owned uh, bodega supply stores, ha I think about half of them went out of business, the other half did well. How can we really avoid displacement of those businesses on Jerome Avenue? Who would do that kind of certification and get those business owners up to speed? So again, conceptually, I'm for the rezoning of Jerome. But at the same time, the city has to understand that there are so many peripheral issues that we have to deal with, namely the auto workers and other businesses. Let's take the auto workers, for instance. There are many of the auto workers who are there, who are the owners of the business, but they also subcontract. I know that there's been talks about training them in another uh, industry or, or relocating them. But even if you relocate them, many of them don't have the certification in order to continue even within that own industry. So I think it's incumbent upon the city. When you look at the different rezonings throughout the city of New York, the city talks about this $1 billion jackpot that, um, they, do in order, that they have in order to uh, mitigate and alleviate some of the concerns in the different areas. First of all, I don't think that that's enough money uh, to do rezonings all over the city. If you want to, for instance, put up one school, it costs $100 million plus. So think about six, seven, a dozen rezonings throughout the city of New York. So we, we have to help out this, the, the, the businesses that are there. I think that we should incentivize any developers that will come so that they can uh, relocate businesses that would be displaced initially in the new commercial spaces. We need to re either train or retrain and recertify um, the, the auto industry so that if we relocate them someplace else, they can have that certification that they're going to need in order to stay in that industry. And then at the same time, I'm not only just talking about people in the strip, Gary. Uh, this would be the first time. I know that folks talk about this place, uh, gentrification. You gotta understand that all of the um, rezonings that we've done, very little of them had anything to do with areas where people actually live. We rezone them and create new housing. We do it in an affordable way at different levels, income, at income levels. But what we need to make sure is that surrounding area around Jerome, from 167th Street to 184th Street, once it starts being developed, we don't want for the landlords outside of that zoning to start thinking that they're now going to start jacking up the rent. Well, this has been the, the story in so many areas. Uh, they talk certainly about Brooklyn, and uh, there's a lot of fear here in the Bronx. Well, again, we, 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 when folks try to make those accusations, I think that they're incorrect uh, because we really haven't, been in a situation where we rezone. We certainly haven't taken anybody's uh, land or property away in, uh, with eminent domain. Uh, but this is going to be, I think, the first test. And, I, and we've learned from other boroughs. We've learned what's worked, and we've learned uh, where we can do better. And I think that we got to start working now with organizations uh, that are already on the ground, like CASA and others, who are plotting, literally plotting and knocking on doors, plot, when I say plotting, like making notes of individuals who have uh, rent-regulated apartments, uh, who are already saying that they're being harassed uh, by their landlords. That's why it was important for uh, the city of New York to pass uh, local uh, intro 214A, mm -hmm. which would give legal representation to those tenants that are being harassed. So these are all the things that we have to have in play, and I am not going to lend my support even though I believe in conceptually, until I see and I feel like the city is going to help us address um, these issues. You talked about <clears throat> building a platform over the Harlem River rail yards. The cost of that platform 
was uh, what ended the West Side Stadium project, as you recall. You've had this idea before. It's been presented about uh, Bedford Park, uh, and, which is not too far from where we are. Can enough money be raised to pay for a platform and still keep rents low enough so that any housing that's built will ease the current housing crutch for affordable housing? So you know that last year we, part of my State of the Borough address, uh, I spoke about a report that I put out with different areas where we need to platform. Uh, when you look at what's happening in, in Morris Park now over the Harlem ra Rail Yards, uh, we've worked with the state. The state put out a request for uh, expression of interest. And so we're going to see what comes in. I think in the first week of March is the deadline for whatever interest different developers and organizations may have. The answer to your question is yes. I believe that we can do this in a way where we can create jobs, union jobs is what I said, where we can create more recreational space uh, and green space for the community, a waterfront access. I believe that we can do this where we can have mixed income and, and particularly uh, affordable housing units that are so desperately needed. Right now, currently, there is nothing there. So I think that this is the wave of the future. When you look at the, the growth of this, the entire city of New York, we're going to start 40, 50 years down the line. If we're thinking ahead down that far, uh, we're going to have to start platforming different areas. Uh, the state is going to have to come with, through with some of this money, but so are some of the developers. Uh, when you were on our show in the past and through the dialogue about Fresh Direct coming to the Bronx, you had talked about electric trucks uh, because many people were concerned about asthma and asthma alley and bringing a, a trucking business. The idea was that Smith Electric was going to ease the burden of uh, truck-induced uh, pollution in an already troubled area for asthma. Well, now they've gone out of business. business. So are the people in the area um, going to be bombarded with a truck, a new trucking business in the South Bronx? It's unfortunate they went out of business, uh, but you got to understand that Fresh Direct did their fair share in trying to get the, um, all of their fleet uh, uh, retrofitted or a new fleet with, Fresh, with um, Smith Electric. Um, the answer to that is the people of the Bronx, A, will get jobs. The people of the Bronx will have trucks and vehicles that are cleaner that are at a, at a higher standard than even the federal standard. Mm -hmm. So when you look at MTA buses, they have to uh, be, uh, they have to meet a certain federal standard in terms of emissions. The entire fleet at Fresh Direct is much more cleaner than mm -hmm. MTA services. Uh, and so uh, we also are gonna make sure, and we announced it this year, uh, in this state of the borough that uh, we were able to be part of the pilot program where EBT cardholders uh, can now uh, order their groceries online, bring in fresh produce right mm -hmm. to their doorstep. So I think when, that when it's all said and done, um, I know that folks have those concerns, but when you look at uh, job creation, bringing fresh produce and healthy foods to, the, to people's uh, uh, footsteps, doorsteps, and the fact that you have a, a, a fleet now that's even cleaner than um, the mass transit uh, bus fleets, uh, I, I think we're going to be in You think it's the best we could do? I mean, I could tell that you were disappointed that the Smith Electric went out of business. I guess not much you can do at this point. I, I, I was disappointed because we, all, we were also looking f uh, forward to not only Fresh Direct, but other uh, companies that we've helped out, as well as the jobs that have, would have been created. And mm -hmm. so we didn't foresee that they were going to have financial problems. Uh, and hopefully in the future, we'll wind up getting um, another company that that manufactures electric trucks to come to the Bronx. I know one of your uh, main programs as borough president has been Not 62, mm -hmm. and you um, do not want, none of us want, to see the people of the Bronx be last in the state in uh, health care uh, indicators. Um, but you uh, mentioned that uh, you were concerned because we still are lagging behind. Um, what are the outstanding issues that keep, keep holding us back in terms of being able to improve uh, the health of the people of the Bronx? Well, making sure that we continue to have fresh produce in an affordable, uh, accessible way. That's the reason why we've continued to uh, increase the amount of, of farmers markets that come to the Bronx, uh, partnering with the rest of the state of New York and bringing those farmers here. That's the reason why we give out those health bucks to make sure that people are, uh, can afford this produce, going around and not only having uh, access to fresh produce, but also teaching people uh, and educating them as to how to produce them. How is it that we uh, teach our kids uh, uh, how to prepare, how to grow vegetables like we do in PS55 with the Green Bronx machine. So I think when, when you look at diabetes, when you look at respiratory ailments, when you look at child obesity, 
Uh, we need people to move and exercise more, and that's what the hashtag not 62 social media campaign is about. Uh, but w w you know, when it's all said and done, it's about what we eat, how we prepare it. And uh, the, the biggest challenge I would think is psychologically um, uh, letting people know that in your homes, inside where you live, what the cook in your house, whether it's your grandmother, your grandfather, titi, uncle, whoever it is, uh, they have to use less salt, less sugar, uh, and, and just cook healthier for the family. That's where the rubber meets the road, Absolutely. so to speak. Yep. Um, you have been a vocal and visible champion of charter schools, mm -hmm. but uh, they are not universally loved. The co-locations have been a problem. In many cases, special ed students do not receive the attention they need there. Schools often cherry pick, it seems, who they want to, to attend their schools. And while some sh uh, schools, charter schools show good results, uh, the total academic evaluations are decidedly mixed. Uh, why come out so strongly for charters? Uh, first of all, when you know, I, I have to disagree when you say that people, are ch your kids are cherry picked. This is a lottery system. If you go to, for instance, uh, charter schools like the Bronx uh, Charter School for the Arts in Hunts Point, if you go to Success Academy, which is co-located with PS55, go and speak to the kids. Go and speak to the parents. The, they serve the same population, and so I think that uh, it's only right for parents to have that uh, that alternative, that, to have that option, so that they can have a school that is comparable to that specific child. Uh, I think that what you get too much of is personalities among adults, the politics. Uh, this is why I spoke in my state of the borough, how we have to you know, lower the temperature, uh, stop with the vitriol, our babies are listening. I think that when you look at uh, those co-locations, many of them have been able to work together, the principals, parents, and students. Uh, and even if you took away every charter school tomorrow, Gary, our public schools will still have the same problems that they have today. So I think it's a canard. I think it's a smokescreen uh, it, to blame every problem on that the public school system has on charter schools. I support, no one supports public, the public school system um, financially or whatever more than I do. I want them to succeed. Uh, but I think that what we need to do is concentrate on that and, and really ask the DOE, the, Dep the Department of Education, to step it up. How is it that the mayor pats himself on the back and the chancellor and saying that graduation rates are at 74%? I don't know about you, Gary, but in my house, I, when I was a student, and my, you better my graduate sons, high school. My, when my students <laughs> and, and my children, um, they both college students, but we did not celebrate C's. You know, I know it's passing, but we didn't. But, and that's citywide. In the Bronx, the graduation rate. I think the rate, celebration was that it went up. And by two down. percentage points. Yeah. Uh, and when you look at the Bronx, however, is the graduating rate is, the graduation rate is only 63%. So I, I think that, okay, maybe you're moving in the right direction, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And, you know, I know that folks want to make accusations against uh, charter schools and, and what it is they should be doing or not doing. But we could do the same for, for the public school system. We need to strengthen our public school system and, and not get involved and mired in if, this, in this, you know, in this uh, politics between them and the charter schools. Well, Let's just get the public school system uh, working and, and doing better for our although children. Although there is a budget reality, and if you spend more money on charter schools that serve fewer students, you're never going to really be able to put those resources into traditional public schools. What do you mean by that? Let me ask you that question. Uh, meaning that you are taking maybe 150 students or whatever the number is and putting them in a school, setting up a whole new administration, setting up a, you know, whatever it takes to set up a school. Uh, if you had those same 150 students in a uh, traditional public school, uh, you, you wouldn't be spending on an extra administration and those kinds two of things, things. Two things, two things. Well, a couple of things. A, the charter schools gets less per capita than the traditional public school student. They don't get any capital funding from, from the city of New York. Uh, that's number two. And, and number three, they are servicing the same kids from our community. It's not like we're busing. It's not, you know, we need to stop with that. It's not like we're creating a charter school in the South Bronx and we're busing in kids from Park Avenue to service them with a better facility. Our charter schools, wherever in the Bronx, are coming from the Bronx. Those are our kids. They're getting less per capita. That's the reason why some of them have to go on and get folks from Wall Street and hedge funds to make up the difference because they don't get the same per capita and they certainly don't get capital funding. With that said, we still have to do much better to help our public school teachers. We still have to give them the resources that they need, and we have to do better to make sure that our public, traditional public school kids are ready when they gra to graduate high school, and even when they graduate, to make sure that they're prepared for college.
Uh, Mr. Borough President, I have to ask you this. You didn't address this in the speech. might not have been appropriate, but uh, we've got to get an answer to the question. Do you want to be the mayor of the city of New York? I would love one day to serve the people of the Bronx and, uh, and also if it means uh, the people of the city of New York at a greater capacity. That's something that we will continue to look at. Uh, if I had to make a decision tonight on your show, Gary. Yes. I would say I'm that the drum roll, yeah. <laughs> I would say that I love my job. There's still so much work that needs to be done, and um, I, if I had to make a decision tonight, I would run for re-election. But we'll see what happens. Uh, I guess that would the the, the hedge there it's, might, it's, it's might flattering. suggest it's flattering. But you know, we'll we'll see. I mean, it's not it's 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 not that simple. Story in the Times today says the Mayor De Blasio doesn't really have any uh, people ready to run, although there may be others who might jump chomp at the bit if in fact he's indicted or something happens with that uh, federal probe. Could that be the kind of thing that would change your mind? Look, I, my heart goes out to the mayor. I don't see, with him, see eye to eye with him on, on a lot of things, obviously. Um, but when it comes to all of these legal um, issues, uh, I don't wish that upon anyone. I hope that he comes out of this okay. He, you know, the, the fact is that w when one person in, in, um, in government is in trouble, I think it's a black eye for all of us. Uh, and uh, he really has to concentrate on making the city better. And if anybody's going to run against the mayor, it should be because they have a vision uh, that they believe is better for the city of New York and New Yorkers, and that they feel like the mayor has just not um, answered the call and has not been able to live up to um, that title of, of serving the people of the city mm -hmm. of New York. Uh, well, uh, we appreciate your sharing your vision here on Bronx Talk Thank and you. on Bronx Net. I will tell you on uh, Optimum 67 and Fios 33 tonight at 11, Tuesday at 11, Wednesday at 7, Friday at 7, Sunday at 2 o'clock. You'll be able to see uh, the entire uh, State of the Borough speech. We will certainly encourage all civic-minded Bronxites, and I hope that's everybody uh, to watch. And we always thank you for thank appearing you. on our program. Thank you. It always goes by so fast. <laughs> I guess it depends on your perspective. Thank you so much for joining us. Folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, send us an email at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page, and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. If you'd like, we will forward it to the borough president's office and get you a response if it's a question for him. You can check out our archives at bronxnet.org. Bronx Talk is on the lower right navigation bar. One quick announcement, thanks to our producer, Jayla Jubetis. This will be the last edition of Bronx Talk she will produce. She has done a fantastic job for us. She'll be with us on the Bronx Buzz into the future, and we will welcome Lindsay Violet as our uh, producer for this program, Bronx Talk, next week. Uh, thanks to director Brianna Roller. We'll see you next week. Thank you again to the Borough President. Good morning.